Hello and welcome to Capital Insight. I'm State Representative Kevin Mannix and I'm your host for this show which is designed to give all of us a little more insight into what goes on in and around our capital and some of the key individuals who are working in our communities to bring about change and also to protect and work with our communities for the future. We have as our guest today a lady who works with our kids and with organizations who serve our kids, Janet Merrill. Executive Director of the Youth Services Consortium. Thanks. Welcome to Capital Insight. Thank you. Nice to be here. One of the things we try to do on the show is to learn a little bit more about the real people who are doing things either in, in, in the front of the scenes or behind the scenes or whatever, but mm -hmm. so often we lose sight of what's really going on with the personalities who are on the front lines of, of what's going on in our society. So I often ask a few background questions. Okay. And it's not really an interview, but I'm curious <laughs> uh, Tell me a little bit about yourself, where you're from and where you went to school. Okay. Well, first of all, I'm a native Oregonian, <clears throat> fourth generation. My family came here in 1865 on wagon trains, so I've been around a long time. I was born and raised in Portland, um, went to Sunset High School, graduated from Portland State with my master's in public administration in 1987, and um, been working in social services in Portland since 1981. Well. In your work with the Youth Services Consortium, mm -hmm. you're serving as the executive director. What do you do in that line of work? Well, the Youth Services Consortium is a little different um, than regular social service agencies. We don't do direct service. We don't actually have kids or families come in and do counseling or case management or anything like that. Um, what we do is we have member organizations, and all of our member organizations serve children, youth, and families. We provide technical assistance to them. We do a lot of training. <clears throat> Um, for professionals and then we coordinate uh, services for a particular target population uh, for instance we we coordinate all of the services for homeless and runaway youth in Portland Multnomah County and that's called Project Luck and we are paid we have a contract with Multnomah County to do that coordination service so part of the job is to make sure the left hand knows what the right hand is doing so yes. they can work together yes Yes. And also perhaps let the left and right hand know what needs to be done or to identify issues out there that need to be addressed. Yeah, exactly. In, in working with the organizations, do you find that there's some com commonality of purpose or are they working at cross purposes? What is, what is your reaction to that out there? Well, uh, Project Luck just recently went through a four-month process where we developed a vision, a common vision, for working with homeless and runaway youth in Portland or Multnomah County. And it included, that process included providers, funders, members from the police department, youth who had formerly been on the streets, um, people who live downtown, citizens who live downtown, and um, somebody from TriMet, you know, folks who all have a reason to be downtown and come into contact with these young people. And we developed a common vision and goals and objectives. And it was a, a long process and uh, painful at times, but we did it. And what we found out was that everybody wants the same thing for our community. Now tell us, what is that same thing? What is that common vision? Um, we want a safe um, community where people feel comfortable being out, out in their community and enjoying it, um, where everybody has an equal opportunity to get what they need and, and be contributing members of society, uh, where youth and children are valued and treated with respect, um, where families get what they need to raise their children, um, where businesses can thrive. Um, we just all want that. In, in terms of putting those goals together, I mean, that, these are laudable goals, and uh -huh. that's a very positive perspective mm -hmm. on what a community is all about. Mm -hmm. Have you tried to identify some of the major problems that confront us as to kids in the community? And can we talk a little bit about that? Then, of course, we ought to talk about the second part, which is the solutions to those problems. Mm -hmm. But what are some of the problems that uh, you've been able to identify or other groups have identified in, in terms of dealing with our youth and that, things that our youth encounter out in society? Well, um, when, I was, when I was growing up back in the 60s, um, you know, <clears throat> lots of parents were home, moms were home, and commu the community was smaller. Um, it was just a different place to grow up. Sort of everybody knew what everybody else was doing, and if I did something mo wrong, my mom found out within 15 minutes before I even got home. You know, she knew what was up. And, um, you know, you had your school and your church and the neighbors and your friends and your family, and they were all pretty close. And now that's changed. There's more people. Uh, families are, um, you know, mom and dad may live in one town and grandparents may live in another. 
and uh, schools are much larger. They have lots more problems to deal with than just, just providing education. And so kids don't have that sort of safety net in the community that they used to have. It's, it's uh, more fragmented. It's not as complete as it used to be. So young people, um, if they get into trouble, they really get into trouble. There's nobody there to help them stay out of trouble and provide them with support and resources. Oftentimes young people don't belong to a church or they may not be going to school every day or they may have a single parent raising them. Grandparents may not be alive or they don't live in the community. So they're just really kind of on their own. And that's when you run into uh, all kinds of problems. Kids just out on the street um, doing things they probably shouldn't be doing and hanging out with kids that they shouldn't be hanging out with or adults they shouldn't be hanging out with. And there really isn't anybody to monitor that behavior and to say, hey, you know, you're not doing the right thing here. You need to be going to school. So um, it's just the society's changed, the community's changed, and I don't think we've, ca we've quite caught up with that yet. We've quite figured out all the things we need to do to sort of be in the, in the uh, you know, almost the year 2000. It sounds like you're describing something of a vacuum and uh, in the sense of uh, community support for these youngsters. Not a complete vacuum, no, maybe it's no. pockets of vacuums. Right, and for some kids, not all kids. And in terms of how we address that, do we try to tie in with existing social service programs or should we be looking for novel approaches? Have you identified some problems in terms of the techniques that we're using today to try to address those issues? Well, I think uh, expecting any one section of our society to, to handle the problem is a mistake. Um, if you think the schools can take care of it, that's not going to work. They can't do it all. If you think families can do it all, that's not going to work either. Um, and, you know, the police can't do it all. You know, building prisons can't do it all. Um, so I think it has to be a community response. And I guess we have to get back to thinking about what community means. And, um, sort of identifying all the members of the community that can help come up with a solution. And through your work with the consortium, do you help identify those members of the community yes. who can contribute? Yes, we do. What are you finding in terms of community response? Has it been positive or indifferent or what? Very positive. Um, we also coordinate services for uh, teen parents in Multnomah County. Many teen parents are homeless or at the risk of becoming homeless. And then we also coordinate services for level seven youth investment. Can and you explain for our audience for a moment sure. what level seven youth investment is all about, sure. particularly the level seven issue? Right, right. Um, <clears throat> what used to be children, Children's Services Division, it's now the um, um, Services to Children and Families in Oregon. Um, they sort of identify r at risk children by levels. And level one is a child who needs to be removed from the home because he's, at da he's in danger of being hurt or he could hurt somebody, or he sh she could hurt somebody. And level seven is the highest level, or the least at-risk level. And those are young people who, oh, they're running away, they're not going to school every day, they may be using drugs and alcohol, parents don't have much control, you know, they may have some other issues that they're dealing with, but they haven't penetrated the social service system yet. They haven't gone to court, they haven't been picked up. Um, so um, services to children and families handed the responsibility for those children over to the State Commission on Children and Families. And um, funding was provided throughout the state to serve those kids in each county. And Multnomah County has a certain pot of money and they distribute it to different agencies and those agencies provide service to those children and families to try and keep them out of jail or whatever. How are we doing though in terms of the funding for these uh, so-called level seven youngsters? Well, <laughs> right now we're doing better than we were two weeks ago. Um, <laughs> we, there was a little bit of a scare. Um, the federal government, uh, when, when President Clinton signed his uh, compromise budget, the compromise budget, it eliminated some discretionary funds that fund level seven services and or those kinds of services in every state, but they fund level seven services in Oregon. And um, it reduced funding for those programs significantly and um, basically level seven services would have gone away just about but um, the state emergency board just last week allocated some money to make up the difference and now each county is trying to find a way to sort of make up the difference so it looks like level seven will stay intact almost 
maybe a few thousand less than they had before, hopefully. Um, I was one of the people that wanted the emergency board to make up all of the difference. Thank you, Kevin. <laughs> we didn't quite make it. It was a 10 to 8 vote on my motion. Um, but I guess that's another story for mm -hmm. another day. Right. Well, we're very grateful to the e-board for that. Well, when there's still possible that some of the rest of the difference will be made up later on. As, uh, it's, there's an interesting tiff that's only a sideline, and I don't want to get us off too much on it, but uh, there's a lot of state legislators who've preached local control and local accountability, and all of a sudden when they don't like what's happening at the local right. level, they suddenly want state controls again. Right. You can't have it both ways. Right, right. Well, back to the kids themselves, though, and the programs. Um, we hear so much about early intervention, mm -hmm. and has the problem been then that our intervention programs are driven by need, and the need is more immediate in terms of those youth who are already acting out in serious ways, and we've sort of run out of resources using them all on that side, and we've not devoted enough resources to that earlier intervention? I think so. I think that's true. And the other issue is that early intervention programs take a while to work. To, well, they don't take a while to work, but it takes a while to see the effects of their work. You need, may need five to ten years to be able to say that program really made a difference. Those five-year-olds, when they entered high school, were ready for school. Well, you've got to fund programs for the whole time to make sure that that happens. So you can say that at the end of five or ten years. And oftentimes, if we don't see an immediate result, then the funding gets pulled. And it's very frustrating. And um, Families are left kind of in a lurch, and providers are, you know, shaking their heads. Well, part of the problem then is that we need to be not just far-sighted, not near-sighted, but we need to sort of have 20-20 vision all the way yes. as to how we're going to deal with these issues with these programs. Right, exactly. And uh, we seem to have been fairly near-sighted in the sense that we want immediate results when what you're saying is it takes time for these programs to show results. Right. And we also have the voters. Um, making a pretty bold statement or a pretty loud statement about um, older kids, older youth who are committing crimes. And we want them off the street. We want to feel safe when we're on the streets. And so you need to do something about those young people. So the legislature has to respond to that need. And that's very expensive. It's, a, it's an expensive response, much more expensive than early intervention. So what we need to do, and don't let me put words in your mouth, but mm -hmm. the, what I'm drawing from this is in terms of the immediate problem. All right, you've got someone who pulls a knife and stabs somebody. You've got to deal with that. You yes. don't want that person on the street. Right. But uh, the programs you're dealing with are looking at the child who is just beginning to demonstrate dysfunction, probably several years after the seeds were planted, but the flower is now blooming. And, right. uh, and you're trying to intervene and deal with that situation. But uh, because people want to see immediate results and you're dealing with programs that take a few years to show results, there's this pressure on. That's right. And the funds aren't always there to That's get right. in there and do it. That's right. Are we seeing any understanding by some of the state officials, you don't have to name names, <laughs> um, about, uh, about the need for some balance here? And uh, you know, well, certainly we need accountability, but we also need to understand the long-term programs that are going to make a difference five or ten years from now. I think we're starting to see some, some people in the legislature that are getting that part of it. I mean, you get it. Um, and. I, I, from what I hear, I wasn't at, I wasn't at the e-board, so I don't know what happened. But I understand that um, a recent um, some research was done by the Rand Corporation, and there was discussion about the the um, sort of the outcome of that research that had just been published in the paper like the day or two before. And people were sort of holding on to that as this is what we need to be doing. We can't put everything into the back end; we've got to put it into the front end. And uh, so I think so. I think they're starting to understand. And I, and I also think what's happening is is that there's that, that legislators and voters are starting to see the cost of the back end and going, wow, <laughs> that's really expensive. What can we do to stop the tide, stem the tide? The waiter has just brought them the bill and yes. now they realize that yes. maybe a diet might have been appropriate exactly. or a different, different meal. Exactly. Let's pause for a moment and I'll mention to our audience that you're with us on Capital Insight. I'm your host, Representative Kevin Mannix from Salem, and we're talking today about kids and the challenges facing organizations working with those kids looking to the future. Our guest is Janet Merrill. She's Executive Director of the Children's uh, Youth Consortium. Youth Services Consortium. Youth Services Consortium. Mm -hmm. I'd like to mention if at any time you have any questions or concerns, feel free to write to me at Capital Insight, H395, State Capital, Salem, Oregon, 97310. Also, if you'd like to call me, you can call me at my law firm. It's 364-1913.
If you call, mention it's a legislative matter so my staff will know to refer that to me personally. And again, it's Capital Insight, H395, State Capital, Salem, Oregon, 97310. We're always happy to hear from you. Getting back to the issues about uh, where we're going to go and all of this, we will always have the legislature dealing with funding issues. But I've noticed in my four terms as a legislator that it's always a crisis financially that uh, it's almost an excuse that's built in when mm -hmm. people don't want to do something say well we don't have the money right. and it's really a matter of do we have the will yes in terms of working together now are, are the the groups working with kids and working with the community as to kids issues finding that by banding together they're able to have more political power to bring these issues to the forefront yes they are that's absolutely true um, the consortium uh, of course we do a lot of advocacy work um, with the legislature and and we encourage our members to call their representatives and and uh, there are lots of them are on task force and committees uh, for instance the governor's task force on juvenile crime is meeting this afternoon and I wasn't able to attend because I wanted to be here with you um, and many providers are on those committees um, the Pro project luck for instance uh, we're always writing to folks like you and, and advocating for services or don't you know don't cut funding here um, the alliance of children's programs is another group of providers around the state they are mostly providers who do provide residential treatment um, and the consortium works very closely with them they're very they're very strong advocates for for kids and for services so um, i think and i and i truly believe that the reason that level seven funding was restored or almost restored cross my fingers um, is because the providers said we can't this can't happen we've got to do something about this and um, it was just sort of a grassroots effort to make sure that it didn't well I'd, I would encourage you with that because uh, uh, the squeaky wheels do get the grease yes. in the political process yes. and uh, my own testimonial would be in effect I do get those mailings and I do notice um, the advocacy and, and it's important because it also provides information substantive information that legislators can't just get by being out there and doing their, you know, we're a citizen legislature, we're out there in our workaday lives, and it's, it's very helpful information. Well, in terms of putting it all together, do you also get involved in the electoral politics side, or do you stay out of that? Or is, it, is that a hit and miss proposition depending on the individuals involved? I think it depends. There are some um, providers in the community that have been um, around long enough and are savvy enough and enjoy it enough that they do that. Um, I, for one, don't. Um, I leave it up to my member organizations to do what they can. I just encourage them to do that and tell them how to do it. Uh, we have a lot of really good friends in Salem who help us. They have all the answers to the questions that, you know, if, if, if I call, they, can, they tell me what to do and what not to do. Um, but there are some very strong advocate for, advocates for kids in the provider community, and they do sort of get involved at every level. Well, in terms of that, the next step beyond that to actually working with the legislature and in terms of the programs that we might fund and, and the philosophy behind those. Can you describe some of the things that are being done out in the community that uh, are working to help kids, the types of programs that exist and others that are at least on the table being discussed mm -hmm. that show promise because they've worked elsewhere? Yeah, I think I'll probably just fo focus on homeless and runaway youth because you and I have had conversations about that population before and it's sort of a hot topic right now. Uh, I think legislation is being designed as we speak for the next session that will address that issue. So I think I'll talk about that, and it's the one I'm the most familiar with. Um, in, in Multnomah County, we have a variety of programs um, from crisis shelter services for kids who are homeless and or runaway um, to sort of long-term transitional housing programs for kids that are never going to go home. It's not possible for them to go home. and it, and these housing pro programs provide them with a safe place to live, employment opportunities, they can finish school, they can go to college, um, they can learn to be self-sufficient. And they're very, very successful. In, in fact, um, one program in Portland called Changes um, has a 100% success rate. Every kid who enters that program graduates, has a job, has finished school. It's pretty remarkable. And if we had 10 more of those programs, it'd be great. We only have one. Um, Currently, um, the state is talking about what do we do about kids who run away, and they're not safe, and we would really like them to be at home, but 
sometimes they can't go home. So what are we going to do about those kids? And this discussion was prompted by three young people being killed in Eugene this last year. Um, Lane County um, has developed a plan, and they're, well, they're still working on it, and it looks, it's, a, it's a good draft of a, a sort of a community, a community plan to deal with the problem, like we talked about earlier, that includes parents, the youth themselves, schools, the police, um, the providers, the funders, um, all coming together and everybody sort of, it's a big puzzle and they're just putting it together. And it, it's, a, it's a solid plan. Um, I, I hope it works. I think it will. Um, it's going to need support, um, funding support from the government and support from everybody. Um, but if they can pull it off, I think um, kids who run away will be safer and they will be on the street less, they will be on the street a, le a lesser amount of time and we won't have parents um, concerned about their young people. Is part of the problem that uh, youth who are runaways or homeless feel threatened by, I'll call it bureaucratic structure and governmental structure and it's harder to get them to avail themselves of services if they feel that there's going to be a sanction or penalty for, for, for going in for help? Well, I think it's a combination of things. It depends on the young person. First of all, we have to, there's a difference between being a runaway and being homeless. And if, a, if a, a young person runs away because they're mad at their parents and they don't want to go home, then they're not going to turn themselves in because they're going to go home. So there needs to be some place they can feel safe going to to talk to somebody about it. And eventually they will go home, but it's sort of like when they're ready to. At least they feel like it's when they're ready to. A homeless young person who really doesn't have a home, I mean, either because his, his parents are homeless or because his parents aren't providing a safe home for him to live in, that's a different story, and um, they're also afraid if they turn themselves in, they'll be forced to go home to maybe a very unsafe place, um, or they're going to be put in jail, or who knows what they're afraid of. Um, so, yeah, they are, they're, they're not so much afraid of the system, I don't think, as afraid of, of um, having to go someplace they don't want to go. So where do we move in terms of trying to relate to, say, the 14-year-old girl? Here I'll say the runaway, first of all, mm -hmm. who's, who's run away from home and uh, has had a, a, a spat with her parents. Mm -hmm. Serious. In fact, let's say her parents have threatened her to some extent. And if we, uh, let's say that they find out that she's pregnant and, mm -hmm. uh, and they're threatening her and, they're, and, uh, and she's worried about her physical situation. Right. Um, how do we respond to that sort of situation, and how should we respond to that situation in the community? Well, in the Lane County plan, and, and currently what happens in Portland, in Multnomah County, is um, a young person would have a safe place to go to, a shelter. Um, designate, everybody knows where it is. And they could, a young, this girl could go there and say, I just ran away from home, my, my dad was going to beat me up, I'm pregnant, I'm scared. You know, my boyfriend is, he moved to California. You know, you can imagine the story. And, um, and I don't want to go home. I'm afraid to go home. So you get a really good counselor to sit down and sort of debrief with this young lady and sort of calm her down and let her vent. And she, it might even be best for her to stay in a, in a shelter for a couple of days. But meanwhile, call mom and dad and say, she's here, she's safe, and she's going to stay here for a couple of days. And then why don't you come in? on Friday and we will do some mediation and see if we can get her back home. And family mediation is very effective because young people, the, the young person and their, and their parents are able to talk about their concerns and what's not going well and work out a plan and a contract for how can this young person be at home and be safe and, and then get this young lady back home. And then probably follow up with some counseling um, for her, um, some counseling for the family. Um, sort of to get them through this crisis. If she if she's pregnant, what are we going to do about that? And the problems we have right now would be, a not necessarily having all the medical services that she might need. B not having the shelter space that we That's might right. need. C not having the counselors. And D maybe having parents who aren't very understanding of this process, or a community that doesn't very much understand that there's two sides to this story about parental rights and responsibilities. Right. Exactly. Um, I think there's parts of that in every community. And there's always going to be families um, that will work well with the system. You know, they'll get a phone call and just be so glad their daughter or son is okay that they will do whatever they can to get them back home. But there's al also always going to be families that are very angry 
and they need to be, um, it, it takes special care and technique to work with families like that. And the system is so overloaded right now. I mean, in Multnomah County, we have 30 emergency beds, 30, and there's, th there's a thousand sh homeless kids on the street. Now, how do we move quickly to try to accommodate that? And I'll mention we only have about four minutes left. Mm -hmm. In terms of dealing with those, the runaways and also the separate group, the homeless, should we be setting up more foster homes or more shelters? What, what would you see as the plan for the short term to help accommodate, besides long-term prevention, which is another element of this? Should we uh, be trying to get some facilities where you can say, look, we've got more shelter space for you now? I think in Multnomah County in particular, what we would like to see happen is a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week drop-in emergency center. We don't have it. Um, where a young person, no matter how old they are, and we, we've got 10 and 11-year-olds on the street now, can go and be safe. And um, there's case managers there that will work with this young person to just get them off the street, a, a place to sleep, food in their mouth, and sort of triage. And, um, and then from there, they, they start calling parents or whoever they need to contact to find out where this young person should be instead of on the street. Um, we don't have it. And I, I think Lane County has something close to that, but probably not with the um, capacity they need. So that's what we need. Should we be designing some state programs that are designed basically to push support to the community programs, or should we be trying to set up statewide programs that set standards? Uh, I think that's a loaded question because it it was, I would assume that local <laughs> communities could do a better job of designing their own programs. Right. But what's your response? I think it, it, as, as much as it can be community-based, that's what it should be. Uh, there has to be standards. Um, more than likely, if it was community-based, it would be funded from the county um, that the community is located in, and there would be standards set. I, we have county contracts. We have standards we have to meet. So I, I think that would be okay. But um, local control and letting each community deal with its families and children the way they feel is best is always going to work. I need to ask you a, a question with about two minutes left, mm -hmm. something that concerns me. A lot of folks out there, including some politicians, make out the Child Protective Services folks at the state level to be a, some sort of ogres. Do you mm -hmm. find that these are terrible people, a loaded question again, trying to break up families, or are they basically trying to protect kids? Well, it's not a loaded question for me. Um, I've worked with Children's Services Division, or SCF, for years, and they're just doing a very, very tough job. And um, there are probably times when they may move in too quickly and take a young person out of the home, but better to be safe than sorry. If that child died or was hurt, you know, terribly hurt, we'd never hear the end of it. You know, why didn't you do something? And um, I think they're just doing a very, very hard job, and they should be commended for it. On the proactive side, what do you think about the programs that are based on the Hawaii model of uh, visiting with families at the time of childbirth and identifying families in need of services and then offering them? I wish we could do it in every county and every state Still in this a country. pilot program in the state, isn't it? Yes. And I, I was in Georgia for a couple of years. Um, they had a pilot project there, and they were very happy with it. The same designed after the Hawaiian model. The challenge for us then would be to move from a few counties on a pilot program to making the it whole statewide. State. Yeah. Then you could stop this. <laughs> An ounce of prevention. A pound of cure. You bet. Well, believe it or not, we've run up our 30 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> and it's been very helpful. I wish we had some more time. Thank you for joining us. And thank you for having me here. I appreciate it. And I'd like to thank our audience for joining us on Capital Insight. There's a lot more to this issue, and I hope you'll keep following it in the public eye. Again, our guest today was a lady who's worked with programs helping kids, Janet Merrill from the Youth Services Consortium. Mm -hmm. And again, thank you for joining us on the show. Thank you.